Hello, 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 my poopers, and welcome back to the IBS Freedom Podcast. I am joined by the best pod person a girl could ever ask for. Hello, Amy, my darling. Hello, my sweet. And the good the good <laughs> listeners at home surely have seen the title of today's episode, but for the sake of doing the podcast thing, can, care to reveal the, co- the um, I almost gave it away, the topic for today? <laughs> the c- 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 topic? <laughs> c- topic? Uh, Good topic. So today we're going to be talking about constipation. Constipation. And Not enough of the poops. Right. Right. I. It's interesting. Like I before this, I was thinking a little bit about what my split in my patient population is between like mm-hmm. constipation and diarrhea. Yeah. I feel like honestly, I, I mean, it's pretty close to even. But I would say if I had to select one being more prevalent. Then another, it'd be more constipation. I don't know okay. why that is, but hmm. but again, I would say for me personally, if I'm having one or the other, I'm more prone to constipation than diarrhea. Hmm. Personally, so and remind this... me when you had SIBO and things were extra squirrely. What was what was the poop variation back then? I would say the poop variation was definitely more constipation predominant. Um, I had methane. I don't think that, like, my constipation was terrible, but uh, preceding the diagnosis, I was probably under eating. Actually, no, I was was under calories for the amount of physical exertion I was doing. I was doing a lot of running. Um, And during that period, I feel like I'd poop, like, maybe every two days would be about my average. Okay. So it wasn't like the scenario where like sometimes I'll talk to people and it's like they're going like once or twice a week, but yeah. it definitely was slower. Um and yeah, so it was slower. That tends to be my the the way I sway if I'm going to sway one the, way or the other. The, the tendency, if right, you will. Right, the tendency. Yeah. Like if things are off, I'm going to sway much more to constipation mm. than diarrhea. The only maybe exception to that is like period around my period sometimes i'll get a little bit looser but other than that i would say more on a consistent basis i'm i'm more prone to constipation but i haven't really struggled with it as of late yeah well and i think um we've talked about this in some capacity going back to like the episodes about our stories and the even the pelvic floor pt episode i definitely definitely had chronic constipation as a kid Like even, you know, even in my baby book, my parents wrote down that when they switched me from breast milk to dairy based formula, immediate constipation Mm. when I was a baby. So even going back to like six months old, that was kind of a tendency. And then, pardon me, I just remember like a lot of time spent in the bathroom and a lot of like, you know, just trying to poop, just, you know, I, I mentioned this to a patient recently, and I think I gave myself away a little bit because we were joking about everybody having computers in their pocket, right, basically, right? and bringing the phone into the bathroom with you and scrolling when you're, when you're pooping. And I was like, yeah, remember back in the day when we didn't have phones and we would have to like get the bottle of Pantene Pro V or whatever and like read the ingredient label right, right, on right. the bottle of shampoo or the bottle of mouthwash. And she was People like, oh, I've never. in there? People used to yeah, have books. or magazines. And she was like, right. oh, I've never, like, I've never done that. I've never like read the ingredient list on the bottle. And I'm like, oh, oh <laughs> maybe I gave myself away that that's how constipated I was, that I was so bored that eventually I was like, all right, Pantene Pro V, what do you got in you? Let's Let's do it. So yeah, so as a kid, and then into my teenage years, that was definitely a tendency for me. Um, I remember I started to get like nervous diarrhea in college. Mm -hmm. When I was a rower, we would have ERG tests. So we would all get on the rowing machines and we would compete for time and see who could get the best time. And I remember before every single ERG test, like I would would disappear and go to the bathroom and have diarrhea because I was so nervous about the ERG test. And, like, it was kind of a running gag on the team at some point where the coach would ask my friend Margaret, Margaret, where's Nikki? And she's like, oh, in in the bathroom. Don't worry, she'll be here. She just had to go have nervous poops. Um, But then I kind of, so my tendency for a lot of years was constipation. Then 
when the shit really hit the fan, so to speak, when the IBS was really bad and I was restricting my diet a lot and trying to figure out why I was so bloated, that period of my life, all diarrhea. Like, Mm -hmm. diarrhea, bloating, intolerance to all the foods. And that was atypical from, like, what I had experienced for the first 20-some-odd years of my life. Then I healed my gut. And I felt like it was pretty normal and I was pooping good and no bloating for a couple of years. And then, like I revealed in the pelvic floor PT episode, ever since I had my daughter six years ago, I back to having that that uh, default programming of like, if anything, mm-hmm. I tend to be constipated. And I've been a little bit constipated for basically six years after having my daughter. Right. So I'm still kind of parsing through all the pieces of that. Like I've done stool testing. I've done SIBO breath testing on myself. Right. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the other causes of constipation, because honestly, we were saying before we logged on here, guys, we have a whole episode about methane. So yeah. we'll just start by saying high methane, whether it's in the small intestine or the large intestine, high methane could cause constipation. You would capture that with a breath test to understand that more completely. And then there's an entire episode that goes into that in depth. So we probably won't talk about methane at too, too much. Although, Amy, if you want to say something about methane, maybe give people like a little refresher of what methane is and why it might be in the gut. Yeah. And, and I like, I like too that you're prefacing this as there are other culprits of constipation outside of the microbiome, because yep. I think that a lot of people get very stuck on the idea that it's their bacteria and they don't see yeah. the forest through the trees and they, they're not seeing other potential culprits. And there are a decent amount of other culprits that can yeah. lead to constipation. And ruling out microbi- microbe, um, microbe-based constipation makes a lot of sense, but yeah. you don't want to totally get solely focused on that. Yeah. In terms of methane, methane is a gas that's produced by certain bugs in the gut. And methane has been shown to kind of slow down transit. So like Nikki was saying, you can have a SIBO scenario where methane is in the small intestines. You can also have large intestine um, methane overgrowths. I know now it's called uh, intestinal methane overgrowth. They kind of broadly... if you will. Right. You're emo. But I think it's with an I. (laughs) Oh, um, you just inspired me for an Instagram reel. <gasps> I should oh, like good. do my makeup and my my outfit all emo and yes. do a reel like that. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm buying a new it. costume. I, I'm beginning to develop quite the costume closet for myself of like all the shit that I've worn in my Instagram reels. It's fabulous. I right. love it. Well, and I, I think too, like there's a lot of focus on methane for constipation and it makes sense. It's yeah. good to rule that out if you've had chronic constipation for a while. Mm-hmm. But I also think we always talk about good microbes and how they're very important, but good microbes have motility boosting effects. So yes. I feel like sometimes people are so caught up in, oh, I have methane or I yep. I need to clear the SIBO and everything will be fine. But there is an aspect where you need to increase your your bugs like bifido and lacto that have yeah. prokinetic type effects. And unless you do that, the constipation might to- might not totally resolve. So like in certain cases, even if you have methane SIBO, you could clear that out and still have some constipation if you're not getting enough fiber. Again, if you're not supporting some of these key species. And I did want to point that out because it's not just these bad bugs that can lead to yeah. more constipation. It's it's not having enough of the good bugs to promote motility. Yeah. Um, and so that's yeah. such a good point. And, you know, it's worth pointing out with the conversation around SIBO and like, I know it's called emo now, and I know that they don't even really differentiate between small bowel methane versus large bowel right. methane. Like we don't even really talk about that much anymore in the research space, but for, for simplicity's sake, we'll just call it methane SIBO because right. a lot of people have gotten used to that terminology for a lot of years. Um, but even in the case with methane SIBO, there's, there are a lot of people who have SIBO on paper, but they are asymptomatic. Like in virtually every research study where they're right. looking at SIBO, there's a small population of people who have confirmed diagnosed SIBO, whether it's from a breath test or an aspirate, and 
they are completely asymptomatic and waltzing around and they have no idea. And now you could you could look at that group and say, oh, they're going to be symptomatic soon and they have inflammation and they just don't know. And oh, my God. But I don't know if we know that. I think it would be interesting to track those individuals as time goes on. But I'm more willing to say that maybe it's not the overgrowth of the bad guys that's always the culprit. Maybe those are the people who have SIBO, but they also have really good levels of Mm. bifido and lactobacillus and acromantia and all of these good bacteria. And maybe that's why they're not seeing the symptoms from what otherwise could be a bad thing. So we think. Right. So I like that you brought up the balance idea. Well, and... And I, that's such an interesting point because I know you've probably worked with these people too, where it's maybe they went to like a functional provider for something totally unrelated to like gut function Mm -hmm. and the provider gets really locked in the idea that SIBO is the problem. Like SIBO comes up on a test and then they do all the SIBO work and like they're, then they start having gut problems. Like, I feel like sometimes there's there's the individuals that aren't having, like, really gut symptoms mm. at all. And they do all this aggressive work from a yeah. gut standpoint, hoping to resolve some other issue. And it just doesn't work. And again, yeah. I, I think that there's there's probably some truth to what you're saying. Maybe they have, maybe there's a subset of people that have SIBO on breath testing, but they have a much better composition and a much better balance yeah. to where it's not causing symptoms gut wise. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you can have a bad thing and then you can kind of negate that with a good thing potentially right. with the microbiome. I think that's a very like black and white way of looking at it, but that's kind of how microbiome research is shaping up is that right. we all have some good stuff and some bad stuff and some kind of in between stuff in our gut. And it's not necessarily that, an overgrowth of something bad is always going to be detrimental. Now, if you have something like Giardia, that's right. probably always going to be a bad thing. But, right. you know, a, a lot of these other microbes that get painted as bad or a lot of these gases that get painted as bad, they actually have some utility. Even, honestly, methane and hydrogen sulfide, those have right. some beneficial effect in the human body. <clears throat> and you don't want to be at a zero methane state. You don't want to be at a zero hydrogen sulfide state necessarily. It's just you don't want to have so much that it's overwhelming for your body. The same thing goes for candida. But that actually, may I segue us? Are you, yes. You think, okay. I've actually seen candida cause constipation or like yeast overgrowth in general yeah. cause constipation. And the way I've historically wrapped my head around it is if you think of mushrooms, where do mushrooms like to grow? in a place where there's moisture and it's damp and it's warm and it's stagnant. And think about a colon that is not pooping very frequently. It's warm, it's stagnant, it's moist, and it it can kind of be a breeding ground for mushrooms for lack of a better way of looking at it. Um, Now, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Is it that the person gets yeast overgrowth because they are constipated for, you know, kind of the picture I just painted? Or is it that the candida caused the constipation? I don't know. If I find candida, I'm usually going to treat it to some degree. But it's very similar in the conversation that we just said. You don't want to get to a zero yeast point in your gut either, because a little bit of yeast is actually important for educating the immune system. And it's a it's a normal part of the microbiome. So likewise, you don't want to go in guns a-blazing and kill all of the yeast in your entire body it is actually a normal part of the ecosystem to some degree right such a such a good point so we talked about one other thing related to the microbiome too Mm. um i wrote it down is that lps which is an endotoxin Mm. tends to affect the nervous system in a way that could slow down motility yeah um so if you have a lot of like LPS producing microbes in your gut, Mm -hmm. that in and of itself could lower motility or decrease motility, whether it's SIBO or not. Um, So doing things that help kind of reduce LPS producers or that can kind of bind to LPS Mm -hmm. to help with constipation could be helpful in certain scenarios. They actually have shown too, um, and this is pharmaceutical prokinetics, so I don't Mm -hmm. know if it would be the same thing 
with herbals like ginger but they have there is there was a study i'll have to see if i can find it again where they had prokinetics being used and they found that lps like i don't know if they injected it i can't remember how Mm. how they did it but that it it inhibited the prokinetic from working Uh, on the nervous uh, system interesting so uh, again i found that really interesting i think I can't remember the exact mechanism nervous system wise, how it was a- a- attacking the nervous system in some way, but basically it it prohibited the prokinetic from working, hmm. which was really interesting. But I think again, like it goes back to like having too much bad and not enough good. If you're if yeah. you're if you have an overgrowth of LPS producers, it could potentially lead to a little bit more constipation. Yeah. Well, and, and that actually, I think, brings up the big umbrella. So we just kind of talked right. about one umbrella, which is microbial in nature. Another umbrella that has some overlap. So like if you imagine a Venn diagram, there is going to be overlap in the middle. But you can imagine um, autonomic dysfunction mm-hmm. and like vagal right. nerve dysfunction, like Poor, poor motility, like that kind of world being another half of the Venn diagram or under this umbrella. Right. And there's a lot of stuff that will disrupt motility. Everything from stress, poor sleep, uh, post-infectious IBS, like the, the post-food um, uh, poisoning model of SIBO could potentially having low stomach acid, like low digestive enzyme output. There's a lot of things, heck, just not chewing your food enough, because that's really stinking important. Like anything that could compromise vagal tone or autonomic tone or like that gut brain connection and disrupt motility has the ability to cause constipation. And I see that a lot. Like there's a lot of people who have constipation and they'll get labeled either as slow transit constipation or idiopathic, which means we don't know the cause. Right. And if you think like slow transit constipation very much suggests that it's like the cause is unknown, but we think that it's like the, the nerves and the muscles aren't right. contracting enough. Like right. the nerves and the muscles are just slow. And that mm. kind of paints this picture of dysautonomia, poor vagal tone, right. poor coordination of motility and like peristalsis and the pushing of the stool through the intestines. Mm. So I would say that that overlaps pretty beautifully. Right. Well, I like that you're bringing up the nervous system component because, and this is sort of um, adding to your comments on it. One thing I've noticed, and I go, I know Datis talks a little bit about this, is like mm-hmm. legitimate brain trauma too. So, like if you've had a concussion, mm-hmm. I've had a few clients that have had like whiplash, mm-hmm. like a couple yeah. that have had, you know, some some car accidents or something that that seem to align like when we actually look at their case we're like oh this is so interesting like a lot of your symptoms came on like a couple months after this car accident and like there Mm -hmm. could be emotional mental trauma and just like physical trauma from recovering from that which could lead to some stress and things like that but i also think if you have like a concussion or something that could affect motility um that's something to think a little bit about too yeah i know datis hits hits that mm-hmm. hard he also he also says too i think he always brings up that one of the first signs of parkinson's which is a very nervous system related disorder is constipation yeah like more than other symptoms which i find really fascinating um but yeah i think that that anything that could affect the brain even like physical injury is something mm-hmm. to think a little bit about too yeah yeah, and I know he's, I remember he talked about a case, for example, um, and the woman, I forget all of her symptoms, but one of one of the chief complaints was constipation. And he did his functional neurological workup, and I remember he was saying that she had a lot of very early signs of like a Parkinsonian mm. kind of presentation. Yeah. Like, you know, this woman was like 30 years away from a Parkinson's diagnosis, <laughs> potentially. Right. Like this was way early. But I remember one of the things that he had her doing was taking kickboxing lessons because a lot of like the Parkinsonian presentation is difficulty with movement and it's very slow movement. 
Um, right. <clears throat> so he basically was having her train, like, train her nervous system and her muscles to do really fast movements and do, like, the kicking and punching. And he was saying in that case that for her, like, she, I think she was doing yoga. And he was like, no. <laughs> like, no. That's not right. what you need. Like, yoga's great, but it's not what you need. You don't need, like, the the slow and, like, the stretching and the holding of the poses. You need something where you're like, bam, 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 and you're doing right. it quickly. And I thought that that was a really interesting thing. Actually, I had a, a patient tell me recently, not on the constipation topic, but worth mentioning anyway, um, we talked, we talked a lot about like just having some work-life balance and having some hobbies and some joy in his life. So I encouraged him to think of things that he used to really love to do, but he doesn't do anymore. And he said, well, God, I used to play the guitar all the time. Like every day I was playing for hours. I was at a band. I loved it. And I, I suggested to him, why don't we make that part of your like therapy why don't we make that something that you can commit to doing just like you know every day or every other day just sit down with your guitar and play with your guitar for a while and he mentioned he said it's been wonderful but there was one instance where he was getting bloated and he happened to kind of be at a point in his day where he was like i'm gonna play guitar for a little bit and he sat down to play guitar for 20 or 30 minutes and by the time he was done playing his guitar the bloating was completely gone i was like interesting and i part of me wonders is it because the guitar brought joy to his heart and that right. was like good for vagal tone or is it that he was stimulating particular neurological pathways with like the intricate fast movement of the right. fingers and then it was more of like a functional neurological thing i'm not sure which but i don't care i just told him to try it again and see if it happens again <laughs> It was like, even yeah. if this cures your bloating 50% of the time, that's profound. That's huge. Like, right. try it a bunch more times and get back to me. Um, well, it's so funny you bring that up because I had a client recently and it's guitar too. So we were like deciding if we, how, we were kind of talking about meditation, that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. And then she was telling me that she's like never felt better. Like she played for a longer span of time than she usually plays for like 45 minutes to an hour or something. Yeah. She usually mm -hmm. just sits down for 15 or 20 minutes mm -hmm. and how she, well she felt. So then we were leaning on that more heavily too. It's yeah. so interesting. And again, there's different ways that could be helping, yeah. but like that helps her more than meditation. So like I, it's one of those That's things, right. it's a good reminder that, there's all these, like, ideas of what's perfect for you and what, like, yep. you should be doing, but there's still a level of listening into what your body's responding yeah. best to and what you're going to get the most, like, benefit from per energy put into it. We should honestly probably do an entire episode and title it, I'm Weird, or <laughs> I've Been Told I'm Weird. We have to think of the title exactly, but I could think of so many examples where, like, somebody you know, right. tries to do the healthy thing. Right. And then they end up discovering that a slight variation on that or something totally different ends up working better for them. Right. Like there's so many examples in like the supplements of the vitamin world, the nutrition world, stuff like that. Like everybody puts meditation on this pedestal and it's great. Don't get me wrong. Or like yoga, right. yoga's up on this pedestal and it's wonderful. I love yoga, but there might be cases where something is even more, profound and impactful for the individual and it's not to say that something's better or worse it's just like you have to play with it and find what works for you um right. so yeah that's that's awesome we'll have to keep everybody posted on those two patients with the guitar <laughs> playing because yeah I, I you know again i was like keep playing with it see you know track the data a little bit again if it cures your your bloating 50 percent of the time even that's amazing keep right. doing it uh, right. but i think it's like showing that his body was craving that on some level and that his body appreciates that. Um, but similarly, there might be some functional neurologic component to a lot of people's constipation. And I think we could probably put that under the umbrella of like vagal tone, autonomic right. control, because all, all of motility and peristalsis is just the nerves telling the muscles to contract. Right. And whether or not that signal goes through. So you can kind of lump all that under a, a bit of an umbrella. But let's say the nerves are doing their job and they're telling the muscles to contract. And let's say that the muscles are healthy and toned and able to contract, but they can't because of a physical 
restriction or scar tissue or an adhesion or another muscle, say like the pelvic floor, blocking their ability to contract. Now, this was something we just talked about it, what, a handful of episodes ago, maybe five, six, seven episodes right. ago. We have a whole episode on pelvic floor PT, but this is a world where, you know, again, like theoretically, you could have the right nutrition, you did all the herbs, you have a perfect microbiome on paper, you manage your stress, you do the yoga, you do the whatever, and it's still not budging. That might be something that you want to look into is this this pelvic floor physical therapy, because the muscles of the pelvic floor, if they are contracting too much or they're loosey-goosey, or if there's adhesions or scar tissue or restrictions, say from like endometriosis or a surgery, this might be something that you want to explore quite a bit more. And then I revealed, I'm kind of playing with this, um, the update to my saga. Mm. I It's funny because one of my patients who listens to the podcast was like, did you get one of those wands yet? I'm curious. And I said, no, I haven't. <laughs> but oddly enough, so after we recorded the pelvic floor PT episode, I kind of felt acutely inspired. And I was like, I'm going to do a couple of these yoga poses that she mentioned on the episode. And I went home and I did some child's pose and some pigeon pose. The one where you like have your, you're kind of like sitting on your foot. I like that pose. It kind of like <sighs> stretches out your hip and. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. I've always liked that one. And I was doing Not that, as much like, as corpse though. Not as much as what? Corpse pose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think corpse pose, then child's pose. Because that would, let's face it, child's pose is pretty lazy too. And then it's really pigeon like, pose. It's really corpse pose and everything else. <laughs> That's how mine goes. It's like when I could <laughs> lay and do nothing. I knew I loved you. From the moment from the moment we recorded our first episode, I knew we were meant to be, Amy. Oh, Bonded. We, it. we should do yoga together sometime and we'll just lay on the floor. Right, just we'll tell our husbands, pose. leave us alone. We're doing yoga, and then we just take a nap on the floor. It'll be great. Right, just corpse pose and like maybe one child child's pose for yeah, you. We'll, totally. We'll... But anyhow, anyhow. So getting back to you know the Sorry, actual I conversation. Distracted here, you. A okay. Our listeners are used to it by this point. Believe they get me. what they get. Yeah, you get what you get on the IBS Freedom Podcast, folks. But to go back, uh, so I started doing these two poses a little bit. And I actually, like, I had to process, am I going crazy or is this helping? I think it was Mm -hmm. helping. And I was doing, like, the pigeon pose, for example, I was feeling it, like, in the hip and the capsule, Mm -hmm. kind of. And I was holding it pretty deep for a while. I was trying to get to a point where I could just, like, fold myself in half over that front leg and just, like, let my body be kind of limp. Um, But I really felt like it helped quite notably to a point where I haven't gotten the wands yet. Um, I don't know if I will, but um, yeah, that that one cool. pose for sure for the win. The only thing is, I think I held it too deep for too long for a couple nights in a row. And then my knee got just a teensy bit pissy at me. And I remembered, I was like, oh, I did this once a couple years back doing too much pigeon pose because I love it so much. Yeah. And it feels so good. Like, it feels really great on the hip. But if I do it too, too much, I think my knee gets a little bit ticked at me. So I have to be mindful of the knee in and amongst right. that. Um, right. But I also, I had two papers to mention and to share. Um, one of the, and there was one paper that I couldn't find, but I was telling Amy before we got on, there was an article, I want to say it was published in the last five years, but there was an article that showed that uh, there was a group of adult women, I think like 20 or 30 women, who had idiopathic constipation like a constipation of an unknown cause and they did pelvic floor physical therapy and about i think it was 66 percent of the women found a resolution in their symptoms of constipation Dang. it's pretty good pretty darn good right like that's that's pretty good i think it was a group of 30 women and i think that 20 of the 30 found resolution in that symptom of constipation um, when I was looking for that article, which I could not find, so I cannot give you the title. I'm sorry. Um, but when I was looking for that, I found two other ones that I wanted to bring up. Mm. One of them, uh, 2019 paper, Benefit of Pelvic Floor Physical Therapy in Pediatric Patients with Dyssynergic Defecation Constipation. And they looked, it was 69 children, and they, um, they underwent pelvic floor physical therapy, and they had a control group. Um, 76% of the kids who received pelvic floor PT had improvement in their constipation symptoms 
compared to 25% of the control group. Also oh. pretty darn good. So if your kid right. is constipated and you can't figure out why, maybe some pelvic floor PT. Um, and then another paper, this one I just stumbled on today too, this is a 2020 paper, Pelvic Floor Dysfunctions in Female Cheerleaders, a Cross-Sectional Study. And they went on, they evaluated 156 women, 78 cheerleaders, 76 non-athletes, and they saw that the cheerleaders were 2.3 times more likely to report symptoms regarding anal incontinence than in non-athletic women. And they basically were evaluating them for, um, to see if they were going to be good candidates for pelvic floor PT. But 2.3 full more, that's the same thing as saying that it's a 230% increased likelihood of having that issue. So right. I think there's probably a lot of other sports that could have um, a, a similar numbers, I would imagine, like sports that are really hard on the body, like cheerleading is. And, you know, I, I don't know what we can what we can exactly liken it to. Because Lord knows, cheerleaders are flexible. They're wicked strong. They probably have abs made of steel. So I don't know if we can pinpoint it to like a lack of tone or like a lack of stretching if cheerleaders have a really high incidence of this issue. So right. it's kind of food for thought. I think that there maybe is more to it than just like, oh, I'm out of shape or oh, I don't stretch. Um, right. So kind of keep well, that in the back of the mind. Interestingly enough, my sister-in-law was a cheerleader and she broke her pelvis. So oh! she like oh. fell on it. I think oh, again, like there's God. maybe a little aspects of that too. Yeah, that's You're true. Probably a lot doing... of cheerleaders have wiped out doing right. stunts. Um, yeah. Interesting. Well, and I, I want to segue a little bit. Is that okay? Do you ever have we wrapped? Me. So I think in our and I could gather that your patients are probably in this vein too, like we've talked about a bunch. But from a nutrition standpoint, there's different things to consider in terms of constipation. Um, I find that, you know, calories are important. So like if you're talking broadly, a lot of my clients that are under eating have some degree of constipation. I've seen once we get calories up, that constipation improves. And there's probably a nervous system, a hormonal, like a just your body getting back into rest and digest when you get calories up. That that happens. Probably fiber naturally increases. Probably carbs naturally increase. Um, but that's like the broadest thing. I think carbs is probably the next bigger thing that I see potentially causing constipation if you're eating low carb. Um I think there's a couple reasons for that. I think that there's a thyroid mm -hmm. aspect or, and just a hormonal aspect that happens if you eat lower carb that isn't great for motility. But I also think naturally it lowers certain soluble fibers in the diet if you're eating lower yeah. carb. So you might not be feeding some of those key microbes that keep things moving. Um, so that's probably like a bigger macronutrient. And then fiber is another one. Again, if you're a low FODMAP or doing sort of a lower fermentation diet, that's enough to potentially cause constipation in certain cases. Yeah. Um, so even if my clients are, are restricting, we still want to make sure that they're able to get enough fibers in their diet. Um, and again, our goal is always to broaden the diet, but, you know, if they're coming to, if they're coming to me at, from a place of more restriction, and I'm seeing, you know, their fibers at 12 grams a day, like that is not sufficient. So yeah. we would need to bump it up um, with foods that maybe they can tolerate. Um, but yeah, I think fiber is a big one. Those are probably the biggest like food or like nutrition related things that I would say go along with constipation. The only other thing would be like fluids, like mm -hmm. drinking enough mm -hmm. water, which... Yeah. I guess is a nutrient, but it's just, it's yeah, not sure. a food, really. It's more drink. Um, so I kind of compartmentalize them a little bit differently. But, you know, if you're not, I tend to be someone that if I'm not paying attention to it, I can certainly drink a subpar amount of yeah. water each day. 
So I'm Cheers. kind of like, I know, I'm, I'm like, I don't, I have some water bottles. I don't know why I don't use them more often. I feel like I'm more like the little girl from Signs where there's water cups everywhere. I, have you seen that? I have not. But okay. it feels like a, a weird thing to say. I'll have to, is it a scary movie? Before I it commit is. to watching it. Okay, it I'm, not, I'm never actually, watching it then. It's no. actually like Abigail Breslin. She's young. She's like, she's an actress. She's probably like five or six when she plays. But the whole thing throughout the movie is that she keeps telling her dad that the water tastes bad. So they keep giving her new glasses and then there's glasses all over the place. Like, oh, this tastes old. You know, she's cl- complaining. Okay. But that's kind of how my office looks. There's always like water cups everywhere. But like, well, unless I have water around, I don't, I won't drink. I, I, on the other hand, reuse water bottles to the point that eventually my husband has to steal the water bottles and wash them for me because he fears that there will be too much lip crud. Um, oh, like God. The, yeah, he'll steal them from me every couple of days. And he's like, these have to be washed. I'm like, well, oh my God. It's, it's with me 24-7. Yeah. See, the thing is, Amy, you just need to live in the desert. When I lived in Arizona and it was up into the 110, 120 degree range, you just learn real quick that you have to carry a water bottle at all times. God. End of story. So you just need to live in the godforsaken desert. And then, which was beautiful, by the way, I actually really loved Phoenix, but you just have to live in a place where your body will whizzle up and shrivel up into nothing if you don't have water on you. Well, then I might die of skin cancer. So... Well, There's yeah. that. I'm, but you don't I'm go out pale. in the sun. That's the key. That's okay. The key. Nobody in Arizona the in their right mind goes outside in broad daylight. Like you go out and you like walk your dog and stuff at like 6 a.m. or not at all. Mm, yeah. And yeah, that's just that's how so you So I'd have to be like months. a vampire. Yes. <laughs> like a, like a, which would make sense, I guess. With my yes. Illness. And you get your vitamin D, you get your tan for the year in like April and October. Not in July, because no, then you'll just frown. But I don't tan. I just well, turn red or white. If you wanted to attempt, I'm telling okay. you, April, maybe into May, and October would be your time of year to get a little bit of a bronze glow. And then get my red summer, on. forget about it. Yeah. Winter is very okay. nice, though. Oh. Yeah. I'm not selling Actually, I have a, but it was lovely. I have, a, I have a basketball coach that lives out there, an old basketball coach. Um, I'll go. have to go visit her. She's lovely. We'll have so. to go to a conference one of these days in Arizona because it's actually one of my favorite places to go back for conferences because then I can nice. stay for an extra day and hike. Yeah. And it's so nice. But we digress. Um, I think, you know, the nutrition piece is really huge. I agree. I think that under eating can definitely cause constipation. And, you know, there's like the scientific explanations of it. Like you said, right. like, you know, kind of like fight or flight, maybe thyroid involvement. I think on some level, too, sometimes I just look at, like, the the bigger picture. On some level, if your body is not getting enough of something, it might feel like, on, like, an energetic level, it might feel like, I have to hold on to this. Right. Even if it is old, nasty food that is now turning to stool, it's right. like, your body's like, damn, I have to hold on to this for as long as possible. I have to extract every molecule right. of nutrition out of this stool. And then it gets harder and more compact. And then it's really hard to pass. Um, but yeah, I think inadequate calories, inadequate carbs. I think the fiber piece is really important. Um, I think sometimes, especially like this time of year with the New Year's resolutions kicking in, there's a lot of people who will go from, say, like a standard American diet, and then they'll be like, I'm going to get healthy. It's January. Bam! Into like Whole30 or paleo or vegan. And right. they go from like severely undershooting fiber to getting a lot of fiber. And right. that could be a lot for the body to kind of deal with. So I've seen people similarly who like change their diet really radically And it looks like it's for the better on paper, but then like the drastic increase of fiber actually makes them constipated because like their microbiome and their nervous system, like their system doesn't know how to cope with that amount of fiber right? fluffing up the poop. So keep that in mind too, that if you increase fiber, you might want to do stuff like that, like kind of incrementally so that you're not going from like 10 grams of fiber to 50 in a day. Right. Um, 
Right. Which that's unfortunately, like, that's something that gets lost with a lot of these challenges and detoxes right. and whole thirties and the low sugar, whatever it is, diet. And um, I think some people then will be like, oh, this, you know, this healthy diet didn't work for me. And then, you know, I could picture right. somebody being like, oh, vegan made me feel so much worse. Vegan diets are horrible and wrong. So then I'm going to yo-yo the other direction and go like paleo, but with like extra meat. <laughs> right. And, you know, or like similarly, somebody might try like a Whole30 and then be like, oh, man, the Whole30 diet made me wicked constipated. Meat must be bad. I'm going to go vegan. And it's like, no, your body was probably just getting used to it. You need to give it a couple weeks or a couple months to really acclimate to the new fiber level. Um, right. But, you know, it, it, it's easier to say that, like, from the outside rather than yeah. when you're going through it. Well, and that's a good point. I I think from a fiber standpoint, too, usually the more fiber you're taking in, the more water you need, the more yep. fluids, I should say, you're going to need, too. So... I think doing it gradually makes a lot of sense versus upping it really quickly and increasing fluids while you're doing it would help with tolerance to more fiber. Absolutely. So like, for example, you could take your inulin and you could mix it with wine and then drink that yeah. down. Fluids, right? Right. So like mostly water, maybe some right. other stuff in there mixed in for the record. Um yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, I think that brings up another another point is that a lot of people use coffee as mm-hmm. a means of pooping. Like, I, I think I revealed to you, I tried coffee for a whole month. I drank coffee for a month. I was very proud. My bitter deficiency, uh, I, I rectified that. And it seemed like it helped me poop initially. But then it quickly wore off. And I frankly was not willing to drink more than one cup of coffee per day because I don't particularly like it. Um, But I know a lot of people who get constipated if they don't drink coffee, which actually, okay, can we can we take a moment to laugh at ourselves here? We've been recording for 42 minutes. And it just occurred to me now, we should elaborate on like a definition of constipation. (laughs) Can we do that at this point, 42 minutes into the episode? (laughs) So if you would be constipated without your coffee, but you drink coffee every day and therefore you poop every day, you still suffer from constipation. Right. If, If you poop every day, but it's really difficult to pass and you have to really squeeze and push or they're little marbles... Even though you're pooping every day, you still are constipated. Mm. Similarly, if you have, like, stools that seem like they're pretty well formed, but you're only pooping every two, three, four, five days, that's still constipation. So it's not just the little rabbit turd pellets and straining. Like, you can have different variations, or you can have constipation that you are band-aiding efficiently with something like coffee, or right. you know, whatever it might be, um, you know, some some herbal compound, but that would still mean that you're constipated as a baseline. Like if right. the if the world ended and Amazon went away tomorrow and you couldn't get oh, your God. coffee, then I know I I don't want to jinx us because like 2020 is not that far behind us. But you know, if everything just imploded and we were out living in the bush again tomorrow and you couldn't get your coffee you would probably find that you are in fact constipated still. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, you know, that's such a good point because how many people are like, Oh, I go every day and it's because of my coffee. I hear that all the time. Yeah. Um, so. And maybe that's treating the root cause. Like it's worth exploring. I think that, you know, coffee is has been shown to increase the diversity of the microbiome. It has some prebiotic compounds and polyphenols that are good for those good bacteria. Um, it's bitter. So like the bitter receptors, it could be working through that mechanism. So there's a couple of ways that coffee might be genuinely working on the root causes of somebody's constipation, but it, it's still kind of worth chewing on and worth exploring a little bit and not just stopping at, oh, I'm just going to drink coffee and call it good. Yeah, I'm not sure if coffee, I know like green tea is a bile flow stimulator, which a lot of bitters are uh, in general, yeah. um, where it could be acting as like a bile flow support, which also yeah. 
helps with motility. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I think you probably want to do some exploration if you're if you're relying on coffee as if you need to do more more support, you probably do. It could be helping some mechanism Um, and that might be interesting to explore, like how is coffee helping my constipation? But yeah. digging a little bit deeper than that would be important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, another point that just popped in my head is exercise. Like mm-hmm. exercise is pretty helpful. Actually, I think that was one of my very first reels that I did. Like maybe a year or so ago, I made one that um, exercise has helped me with constipation in the past as well. Um, yeah. Typically, what I've personally found is that days that I walk... Like, I live about a mile away from my office. On days that I walk to and from the office, or if I go on a walk at lunch, I have found that that doesn't help with constipation for me Mm -hmm. personally. But on the days that I get a good workout and I do, like, I really get my heart rate up and I'm breathing heavy, like I go for a run or I do weightlifting or something, that, like, the more intense exercise does generally help with my constipation. Nice. I think movement's a big one. Because, I don't know, every, like, lifestyle factor outside of diet, I feel like, gets a little bit less press. And I think movement's a really interesting one. I know, like, people like Dave Mayo talk a lot lot about Mm -hmm. movement and, and, like, motility. Um, I I think movement, again, there's a bioflow component there, too. Mm -hmm. Like, when you move, it seems to increase bioflow. And we've always evolutionarily paired movement with like digestion because we were moving to catch prey or to gather food. And there seems to be some sort of priming effect on digestion and motility when we move regularly. Um, So I think that's a really good one to point out. And I think, again, movement can be I feel like people are either good at moving or, or like it's an area. Everyone has their area of like struggle busness. I feel like like yeah. for some people it's like the stress management they just like could not control that. For some people it's kind of the movement piece. For some people it's sleep. Like I feel like everyone has that one area that's just like uh, it's the problem child or area. Maybe two or three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So again, like I think that everyone has their area, but. I think that, like, movement, you want to find something that you enjoy doing. And, um, again, movement, some movement is better than no movement. So it's sort of like, not to quote Nike because I really don't like it, but, like, just do it sort of mentality. (laughs) I don't love that saying because it makes it feel like you don't listen to your body or something. But, like, you, you want to get out there and try some things and see what feels best for you. Um, from a movement standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, finding something you enjoy will ultimately mean that you're compliant with it and you do it for a longer Mm -hmm. period of time. Like I've shared before, I think of the exercise episode, like I have a bachelor's degree in exercise science. I know that exercise is good for me and I can tell you the physiological ways that it's good for you. But I just, I've been kind of frankly burnt out on exercise ever since I stopped rowing and it took until the last couple of years discovering the fitness marshal on YouTube and getting a set of free weights that I could just use at home, where now I'm kind of more in a bit of a groove, um, where like I will work out a couple of times a week and like it's it's not a struggle. But like dragging myself to the gym and like going to the gym for the sake of going to the gym never really worked for me. It, once I got to the gym, I generally liked working out there, but it was always that motivation of like getting dressed, leaving the house, fitting it in my schedule, getting there, get, you know, getting right. dressed. Like it was all of the lead up getting to the gym that I really struggled with historically. Um, but now that I don't have to go anywhere and I just dance like a fool in my living room with the fitness marshal, I don't have to go anywhere. I just throw on a sports bra and a pair of shorts and I'm good to go. Um, right. But yeah, nice. that's, that's been helpful for, for constipation. Um, I'll bring something up, too, to to start wrapping up, because I think we've hit on a bunch of the big ones. We've talked about microbes, both in the capacity of too many bad guys, too few good guys. We've talked nutrition. We've talked, you know, motility, kind of issues and dysautonomia. We've talked 
exercise, hydration, uh, pelvic floor PT. Another thought, and this is admittedly, this is something that I just Googled and brought up on my screen for today. I am not an expert in this arena, but it's worth maybe thinking about is traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, has an entirely different way of viewing the body and looking at the body systems. And there are like Chinese medicine reasons for constipation that I think go beyond the scope of this particular conversation, but it's just worth to, to kind of think about. Um, so for example, there's four things that I brought up um, as far as like TCM diagnoses that could lead to constipation. And we can noodle mm -hmm. on these a little bit to our best, best ability. I will say though, to preface, the last time I got acupuncture, which was admittedly overdue, I need to go back. Um, but I think maybe like a year ago or so, I, I got an acupuncture session. I don't remember the reason now. Um, but I went in and, you know, they like put the needles in you and then they leave you with the glorious, glorious heat lamp to bake in the oven under the heat lamp for like 20 minutes or whatever. And they leave you there right. to listen to the Zen music and they, they leave the room and you cook with the right. heat lamp with the needles in, you marinate and then they come and take the needles out. Well, when I went in and I got my last acupuncture session done, she put all the needles in, she walked out the door and she left me to marinate. And the 20 minutes that I was laying on that table, I could hear and feel my guts like, oh my gosh. And she, my acupuncturist is only like a mile away from my office. By the time I drove back here to my office, I had to poop. And I ran up to the bathroom and I texted her afterwards because I was like, thank you, Colleen. I had the best poop ever because of you. And of course, she rejoiced because an acupuncturist gets it. Uh, but right. the point is, I like, I felt like that was the most awake and alive I've heard my enteric nervous system in a while. And right. it was when I was, I was laying there with the needles in and they were like doing their magic. So that being said, um, okay. So the TCM kind of perspective, um, there's heat induced constipation and like heat in TCM is a little different than what we would consider heat, but just bear with me anyway. The symptoms of heat induced constipation are hard, dry, hard stools, aversion to heat. Um, so like somebody who tends to be like more, um, like they run hot typically, right. I think, uh, dry mouth, frequent thirst, bad breath, or dark colored urine. There's blood deficiency. The symptoms might be dry stools, pale complexion, often accompanied by dizziness, heart palpitations, or somebody that's prone to forgetfulness. Um, and that you could kind of loosely correlate blood deficiency with what you might imagine blood in Western medicine, like maybe iron deficiency, B vitamin deficiency, stuff like that. Um, and then chi, which is like your, your vital force, uh, it, constipation can be because of chi stagnation, which would be dry stools, sense of incomplete defecation, abdominal distension, frequent burping, feeling of flatulence, or decreased appetite. That one in particular sounds like 90% of our patients with IBS, honestly. Mm -hmm. So chi stagnation could be a very useful one to explore. And then chi deficiency, uh, difficulty passing, passing a bowel movement, lethargic or breathless after having a bowel movement, prone to panting or easily fatigued. And I could see that one going more along the lines of like somebody who is really burnt out and really frazzled and they've been burning the candle at both ends and like they're so depleted and so deficient now that they, they're they like having a hard time kind of keeping up with, with daily demands. Um, I think stagnation, I also would, would picture that as somebody who's feeling stuck on some level. Sometimes mm -hmm. that'll go with that kind of presentation. Again, admitting I'm not trained in TCM, but my very, right. very basic understanding, like chi stagnation could sometimes come up when you feel stuck or um, like, I know there's, there's something where chi gets stuck in the throat 
and it feels like a lump in your throat. And they say that that's due to having something that you want to say and you're not saying it. So the chi is stuck in your throat. That's an example of chi deficiency. So like, I think the chi stagnation, the one that sounds like a lot of IBS to me, sounds more like somebody who's feeling stuck or they're feeling like they can't say something on their mind. And those things could go back to a lot of like mental health related stuff and vagus nerve kind of stuff. Like if you're feeling unfulfilled or you're stuck in a job you hate, you're stuck in a marriage that you aren't happy with, you're stuck in a location that you hate. Um, you know, you, you want to say something to your coworker or your spouse or your boss or your mom, and you're not saying it because you're trying to keep the peace. Like that kind of Mm. stuff might be more the chi stagnation kind of type, I would imagine, versus the chi deficiency, the person who just gives, 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 and like takes care of everybody else first, or they break their back going through college and just like burning themselves into the ground. And then they overwork themselves to death at their job. They overwork themselves taking care of all their family members before they take care of themselves. Um, I would think that would be something that would set you up more for like the chi deficiency. If there are any acupuncturists listening, please, for the love of God, comment down below and let me know if I'm accurate in these statements or if I'm totally off my rocker. This is my very rudimentary basic understanding of TCM. Um, But anyway, but those are four other kind of profiles that constipation might have that Chinese medicine could be really mm. helpful for and getting getting some needles put in. Yeah, the chi, the chi stagnation is almost like if you're stuck, your poop's stuck. Yeah. And gas, too, because they said yeah. abdominal distension is part of it also. Yeah. yeah. I think the only two other, like, comments I'll make on potential culprits with constipation that we haven't mentioned are, mm-hmm. we kind of have, is thyroid related mm-hmm. issues. Yep. Um you know, thyroid's going to slow down motility. So at least exploring that as a option. Yep. Getting some lab tests if you're constipated on on getting that done by your doctor. Hopefully you can get a full panel, but some yeah. are a little bit more problematic in terms of running that. But if you can get a, a good look at your thyroid, especially if you have symptoms like fatigue or like dry skin hair falling yeah, out brain fog um right sometimes weight gain um feeling cold uh that kind of stuff if you have other symptoms of thyroid i would definitely check that out um you could also try to palpate your thyroid a little bit so like for those hmm. of you on youtube you'll be able to see me but you can kind of put put a hand on either side of your throat like this and swallow a couple of times and you should feel like the skin and some of the connective tissue moving underneath your fingers but if you feel a palpable lump then that could be that your thyroid is a bit enlarged Um, and then you would do it on the other side you would feel if you feel a nodule you shouldn't feel like a little hard bump like a nodule either so make sure you get that checked out but just even having your doctor feel your thyroid and be like hey is this is this enlarged and i'll just say make sure that they ask you to swallow. If they feel your thyroid and say, yeah, it's good, and they don't make you swallow, they're not doing it right. Mm-hmm. Um, that happened to me the last time my primary care palpated my thyroid, and then I just, like, I took the liberty of swallowing to make sure that it was done correctly, but she did not prompt me to swallow. Mm-hmm. Um, so just make sure they're doing it the right way, because you need to have that movement to really feel the, right. the lump or the lack of lump move under your fingers. Um, and then certainly getting like T4, TSH, T3 done would be the bare minimum to get a good look at the thyroid and make sure that you have good levels of all of those. Yeah, it's interesting to me. And again, it doesn't, it's not like I'm seeing people with goiter all the time, mm. but like I have noticed, I noticed a person on TV who had a very clear and obvious goiter. It was like on this reality show I was watching. And every time she came on, I was like, gosh, she has got a goiter. Like someone needs to tell this girl to like yeah. go get her thyroid checked out. Yeah. And then again, someone that my husband knows, like not close at all. Like I think they went to high school together. Um, I swear she has a goiter too. But like, mm-hmm. again, like I feel like it's not my, I don't know. Maybe it is my place to be like, oh, maybe you should like get that yeah. looked at or something. But, like, sometimes it, it's very rare. Right? It's not like I'm seeing goiter all, all in tons of different people. But sometimes you can actually see it visibly. 
on people too which if it's visible yeah. it's probably a bigger problem yeah um but yeah and similarly like you can swallow and look in the mirror um right and the movement will really tip you off but yeah i've, I've seen goiters before i've seen um i've seen like mild diffuse enlargement uh, of the thyroid a handful of times and i saw one prize winner of a goiter one time and it ended up being iodine yeah. deficiency yeah. which you wouldn't think in you know but this being america you know we have iodized salt but this particular patient doesn't really eat processed food and right. she made the switch to sea salt which is healthier right no nah, man because if you're not eating a whole bunch of seaweed then you're gonna run the risk of potentially becoming deficient and she came in she was like I think I have a, like, I think my thyroid's enlarged. Can we, like, do some testing and check it out? And I said, yeah, come on in. She comes in. I take one look at her. I was like, God, yes, that's a goiter. Hold on. Let's, and I palpated. I mean, I didn't react that way. But right. I was like, okay, you're right. Palpated, sure enough, goiter. We ran her labs. Her TSH was up at 12 or 13, I think, if I remember correctly, which is pretty dang high. Right. And I said, all right, go home. Get some iodized salt. And just, like, use it half the time. Like, half right. the time you could use your sea salt. I like sea salt. I have nothing against sea salt. 50% of the time, use the sea salt. 50% of the time, just use your iodized salt. We'll retest in six weeks, see what happens. And in the six weeks of doing that, the, go the goiter went away and the TSH totally normalized, went back down to two point something. So it can happen. You can be iodine deficient in the United States in this day and age. It's just not super common. But right. as, as sea salt becomes more prevalent and iodized salt takes a back seat, it, it can happen. Right, right. It's a good point. I think thyroid's a, a good one. The only other thing that I'll mention is like circadian rhythms. We talked a little bit about sleep, but um, these your sleep-wake cycles and the different circadian rhythms that you have in, uh, in your body often control like a lot of different things. They anchor hormone production oh, yeah. at certain times of day. They're going to anchor yep. gut function. And there is some evidence to show that like circadian rhythms influence motility, especially colonic motility. Yep. Um, so getting sunlight on a regular basis during the day, even if it's through a window, trying to avoid blue light in the evenings, um, trying to sleep at similar times, trying to eat at similar times yeah. could be helpful for motility too. And it's, again, it's a less discussed um, area, but I, I think it can be really important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm glad that you brought that up. And there's even something to segue back to our very first point. There's something called the microbial clock, mm -hmm. where it's like your microbiome has a circadian rhythm of their own, but they don't have the luxury of seeing the sunlight, right? Like the bugs right. that are in your colon, they don't see the sun, I hope. So mm -hmm. they get all of their cues for their circadian rhythm from you. Right. Namely, whether or not you're feeding them. That's the main stimuli that they're they're figuring out. So similarly too, I'll throw out people who have like a late night snack. That might be involved. Like I remember my grandfather for a lot of years would like if, if he couldn't sleep for whatever reason, he would get up and this was like back in the late 90s, early 2000s. He would go in uh, the guest room where they had their computer and he would play Euchre or Pinochle with people oh on the, the Yahoo chat rooms right. where they had like the card games and stuff. And he was so cute. He was so fascinated. Like, I just played with somebody from Australia. And we're like, cool, Grandpa. Um, but he would go play cards late at night on the internet with people in God knows what country. And he would have a big old bowl of Cheerios at like midnight or 1 a.m. And I just wonder now, I'm like, I wonder how he pooped. Like, right, I wonder right. if that was impacting some stuff. Um, so similarly, like late night snacking or erratic, erratic sleeping patterns, that's going to signal weird things to your microbiome. And then it's going to be more difficult, not impossible, but it's going to be a lot more difficult to rehab your microbiome and have a really stellar microbiome on paper if your sleep pattern is all swirly. And I'll right. throw out there too, sleep and stress are very much connected. We lightly touched on this, but um, 
your circadian rhythm and the secretion of melatonin and cortisol is very much linked with stress chemistry because cortisol is one of the stress hormones. So right. similarly, stress can cause constipation. And I've, I've seen it go both ways. I've seen people who get diarrhea when they're acutely stressed. But I think for chronic, chronically stressed individuals, it's more going to lean towards constipation for a lot of people. Um, so just making right. sure that you're really mindful of that and kind of unpacking that in whatever capacity you can, whether it's therapy, you know, hypnosis, acupuncture, exercise, like talking to friends, whatever it might be, whatever tools you have in your tool belt, but being mindful of your mental health and your stress and making mm -hmm. sure to not completely overwhelm yourself and overburden yourself. And again, like make yourself chi deficient. Um, mm. I think that that goes a long way too, but stress is a really big cause of constipation for a lot of people. And I think that that's one of the pieces for me. I think that probably as I learn more about my relationship with stress and I kind of unpack some of that for myself, um, it's becoming more apparent that that's probably a, a significant piece of the puzzle for me. Yeah. Well, I think again, we all, I think we all have some degree of stress Oh, yeah. As a part of our equations, too. Some, again, it might be more prominent than others in terms yeah. of their symptoms. Um, but, yeah, I, I think I think the stress piece is huge. I think, again, a lot of the things that are just baseline and help a lot of other areas of health, health are going to help with constipation, which is nice. It's not just that you're going to feel benefits of constipation or relieving constipation from exercise, or that you're just going to feel that, oh, constipation gets relieved from stress management. It's going to help you in a lot of other areas of health and um, probably make you feel a lot better just in general, not just help the constipation. Yeah, I think so. And, and isn't that the goal, honestly? Right. Like, right. would you rather just poop better, or would you rather, like, have have better poops and a healthier immune system, a healthier brain, a healthier metabolism, healthier, you know, relationship right. with food, better sleep, right. better energy. Like, I think that's really the goal is to do something that's going to benefit your whole body. Right. I agree, my friend. Whereas Miralax will only go so far. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Same thing with Dolcalax, which is even more yeah. kind of stimulating. Um, yeah. Do we have anything else? I can't I feel think like of anything. That's basically a wrap. I think that that hit on a lot of the constipation highlights that I could think of. So, mm -hmm. guys, thank you so much for tuning in, as always. You know the drill, but I'll tell you anyway. If you're on YouTube watching this, if you could click like on this video, subscribe to our channel, leave a comment down below. We would love to hear from you. And if you are on a, you know, an audio-based platform like Apple Podcasts, if you could drop us a five-star review, that would be so helpful and so fabulous. We would deeply appreciate that. And we will see you right back here in the next episode when we discuss diarrhea, the yin to the yang of today's conversation. So we will see you very soon on the IBS Freedom Podcast. Toodaloo.